Okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, yeah, it's great to be doing another one of these uh, webinars. I am just trying to get my presentation on full screen, but I suppose it will work all right like this. Are you happy with this, Jenny? Just do sl slideshow from beginning, Steve. Yeah, hang on, I'll just have to... And, um, and you might have to just, put the point... to start back. again, yeah. Sure. Hmm. Steve, just don't use the annotator and then do slideshow from beginning. No, you need to put the torchlight away, I think. Yeah, no, I got it now. I got it now. Okay, sorry about that. False start. Can we start again? Yeah, that's all right. Off you go. All right, everybody. Thanks, Jenny, for the introduction. And um, yes, I'm Steve Flint, as Jenny said. Uh, novel enzymes with the potential to revolutionise cleaning in the dairy industry is the topic for today. And the reason I'm presenting this is that we have just finished a piece of work with a master's student um, looking at some enzymes that do, I think, have a lot of potential for the dairy industry. They've been developed for the dairy industry by a company called Cinder Bio in the United States. Um, and they are pretty unique in terms of being targeted to specific foulants that we have problems with in the dairy industry. Um, and they're quite unique because they operate at high temperature and low pH which offers a number of uh, potential advantages to the dairy industry. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to start with uh, some introduction about the cleaning challenges that we have in the industry, uh, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'm going to move into talking about these, um, the use of enzymes, in particular the Cinder Bio enzymes that are quite different to the enzymes that we've used in the past in the dairy industry. Uh, I know when I first started at um, Fonterra or um, the Dairy Research Institute many years ago, we were using enzymes quite frequently for cleaning ultrafiltration plant. And we moved away from that largely because of the expense of it and the fact that we could get away with using caustics uh, for cleaning membranes. Uh, but now I think we are interested in trying to develop our cleaning systems better and if we can find something that's more environmentally friendly and something that offers a little bit more in terms of efficacy, uh, these enzymes I believe have potential in that area. So that's what I really want to focus on today. So I'll talk a bit about the test <coughs> methods that we used um, and give you some of the results that we have and look at where we're actually going to go next uh, with these enzymes. Okay, so in terms of what we are faced with on a daily basis in the dairy industry, we are facing with plant getting dirty. It's uh, something that we, we have to battle every, every time we run a product through a plant. So we end up with foulant, uh, which re results from the contamination of the materials that we have in the dairy fluids we're putting through our dairy manufacturing plants. So we have bacteria, but we also have proteins and fats and various other components, mineral components, which contribute to the fouling. Um, and then once the plant is fouled, of course, the foulant and, and the microorganisms within that foulant are released um, into the bulk product, contaminate our product, and we have issues with simply contaminated product with material that we don't want. Um, enzymes that break down the, um, the proteins and the fats in our products and all sorts of prob problems with product functionality and sensory issues. So it is a, a big problem for us. Uh, so our surfaces get fouled and then we have to clean these surfaces on a regular basis as we know. Um, and we end up with hopefully a clean surface. So essentially when we're cleaning, we're reversing the fouling process and, and ideally generating a, a clean surface. But the reality is we never generate a completely clean surface. There's always material left behind. Um, which can serve as a focal point for further fallon to build up on that surface. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, just to remind us about the different types of milk soil that we have. Um, I, of course, tend to focus on the microorganisms, but the microorganisms are in a very nutrient-rich environment consisting of lactose, fat, protein, salts, and so on. And, of course, each of these components that we have in the dairy industry really requires 
um, a different type of cleaning system in order to clean it effectively. So lactose tends to dissolve quite nicely in water and relatively easy to remove, uh, more difficult if it's caramelized. With fat, we find that that is pretty poorly dissolvable in water, so you need some sort of surfactant to solubilize it and remove it from a surface. Um, alkali seems to be pretty good at doing that, um, but it's more difficult to remove if it's polymerized um, in the plant. Protein, uh, poorly soluble in water, um, medium solubility in acid and good sol solubility in alkali. So again, this is why we use caustic so extensively in the dairy industry to remove protein. Um, more difficult to remove, of course, if it's been denatured, which happens on a frequent basis where we're exposing to heat. And then we have the mineral salts, which um, are more soluble in acidic conditions. So hence we use acid cleaners to clean those from the surface of our plant. Um, now, in depending on the actual soil types and whether the soil has been generated in a cold or hot system, um, we find that we end up with more or less of different components. So in cold milk, the soil um, is, is often lactose. Um, and in hot milk, it tends to be more trace, traces of lactose that we have. Um, and in milk stone, it tends to be traces as well. Um, fat and cold milk, uh, you can see the percentage figures there. Um, and we have more in a hot milk situation and also some bound up in milk stone. Uh, protein, you can see the relative differences in terms of um, protein from cold milk soil through to hot milk soil and milk stone as well. Um, and there's also ash um, involved as well, which um, tends to be greater in heated systems and also in milk stone. Okay, so the cleaning programs we use fairly standard, but just to remind us of what we have, we tend to adjust for hot surfaces, cold surfaces, and of course we also have sanitation programs, which may or may not be used, uh, tend to be more used in the cheese industry than any other part of our industry, uh, largely to try and combat phage um, in that part of the industry. Um, so hot milk surfaces, uh, warm water rinse, an alkaline detergent, um, another warm water rinse followed by an acid solution, and then final events with cold water. Um, temperature is pretty important, concentration is pretty important, and whether we use an acid cleaner or not largely depends on the history of the foulant and the type of foulant on the plant. Um, so alkaline detergents tend to be used more frequently, and in some cases we, we do these shorter cleans which just use a quick alkaline flush um, and don't worry about any acid um, cleaning at all. Um, in a cold surface, um, a warm water rinse, alkaline detergent, um, acid clean will be pretty rare in a cold water system. Um, the cold water surfaces tend to be less of a problem compared with the hot surfaces because um, in the hot surface you get bake on and denaturation and so on, which makes it more of a challenge for us in the food industry and in the dairy industry to actually remove uh, these baked on deposits from the surface. And as I said earlier, sanitation programs not often used. Um, the ideal sanitizer really is um, hot water um, or steam, um, but we tend to use chemicals such as chlorine as well. And um, depending on the severity of the problem, we can adjust the, the chlorine to, to deal with the foulant as a sanitizer, or in some cases, it can be used to help remove biofilm from a surface, which is something I've talked about in earlier webinars. Okay, so soil removal, um, I mentioned the you know, concentration of the chemicals are important, the temperature is important as we all know, um, the time for cleaning is also important, and, and the flow or kinetic energy or brushing um, to remove material from surfaces is, is all important. So what I like to tell my students is that all these things need to be in balance, and so I tend to draw a circle like you see on the screen, um, which balances out the concentration, time, temperature, and kinetic energy. And we can compensate for each of these to a certain extent. So we can reduce the concentration if we increase the time proportionately to ensure that we get a, a reasonable clean. Um, however, after cleaning, we do often see plant that is anything but clean. And from a microbiological point of view, we know this happens very, very frequently. From a pure deposit point of view, uh, we only know this if we actually open the plant up and have a look. 
And um, this is an example of evaporator plate after CIP, which has been very poorly cleaned, uh, with a lot of deposits left on that um, on that plate. And you know this is seen on a on a unfortunately too frequent basis, and indicates that our cleaning systems are, are not up to scratch. So even though the do we do the best we can. Um, we, we sometimes end up with a situation where it does get out of control. And one of the biggest problems we have in the industry is we don't really know how much material is building up during the manufacturing process. It's not something we can monitor very easily. Um, you know, we don't have any, any controls or real-time controls to monitor the buildup of material in plant, uh, which would really help us in terms of optimizing the time at which we do a CIP. Um, if we take a sample of material or a sample of stainless steel, um, as we can do if we actually incorporate little stainless steel coupons into a plant, and we look down the microscope, we can actually see extensive buildup. I mean, you saw the macroscopic view before. This is a more microscopic view. So you can see there's quite a lot of material in there all bound up. Uh, this is a whey protein deposit on a stainless steel surface, um, which, you know, when you look at it at this level, you can, you can see um, a lot of topography in there, it's um, a lot of material piled up upon other material. Um, and that, as you can imagine, be very difficult to remove. Um, this is a whey protein deposit after alkaline cleaning, uh, looking very smooth on the surface, but the surface, uh, which in this case is uh, stainless steel, should not look like that. Um, it should look a, a lot cleaner than it does. There's a lot of material left on that surface. This is a, um, a graph that I use quite frequently when I'm talking about cleaning. And what really interests me about this is, is two things really. Firstly, it shows that often a surface is never completely clean. So you can see in terms of the work that's been done here by Mike Bird in the UK, uh, what we're looking at is a graph that's showing an increasing concentration of sodium hydroxide um, and the effect that's having on whey protein deposits and it never really completely removes the whey protein deposit, even at 0.6%, um, which is the best clean that we're getting um, in this particular case. Um, but the other thing it's emphasizing is that adding more chemical is not always the best way to go. So if we add more than the 0.6%, uh, we see that we start to get an increase in the amount of material that's on the surface and the cleaning time needed uh, to remove that material. Um, so the cleaning time becomes more, indicates that there is more deposit on that surface is more difficult to remove. And the reason for that is that the sodium, con sodium hydroxide concentration is simply gelling up those proteins and making them more difficult to remove. Okay, moving on to microorganisms. This is Bacillus lichenoformis, which is one of the most common spore-forming bacteria we have in the industry, particularly in the milk powder industry, but also in the whey processing industry. And this is a, another electron micrograph. You can see the cells piled up upon each other um, in a biofilm, the spores in there. Um, it's quite an extensive um, contamination of a stainless steel surface. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out um, to you, which I don't think I've used in one of these webinar, webinars before, is that um, we can remove bacteria from a surface and we hope that our uh, cleaning systems do a lot of this. So we're hoping that our cleaning systems will remove milk deposits and we're hoping that they'll also remove a lot of the bacteria. Um, but the reality is there's other material that's also left behind. And this um, slide shows you some of the material that's left behind once an organism has vacated the surface. So in these two pictures, we're seeing an outline of an organism and basically a depression which indicates where the organism was sitting before it was um, sheared off the surface through the cleaning process. And that material is left behind as the extracellular polymatrix material, um, which consists of a whole range of things, which I'll show you, show you later in the next slide. Um, it's a whole range of different um, chemicals in terms of composition, but that's left behind on the surface. And that is also a source of further contamination. It's an anchor point for further microbial cells. Uh, can also interact with the components in any uh, dairy system. So the, the uh, milk fat and protein can also interact with it. So we're ending up with not a clean surface. And I think we, we know that that happens in our industry quite a lot. Uh, so the efficacy of our cleaning systems is, is not ideal. Um, there, there's more we can do to improve on that. So just diving into this polymatrix substance, 
um, a little bit further. So if you look at the central, central column here on the slide, uh, we're looking at the various different components of what we call EPS, extracellular polymatrix substances. There's a whole lot of material in here um, that contributes to the phalant on the surface. Um, there's the neutral polysaccharides, amyloids, charged hydrophobic polysaccharides, extra, extracellular enzymes, which of course can um, cause problems in terms of product quality. Uh, there's amphiphilic substances, there's membrane vesicles, lectins, a whole range of things. Nucleic acids, which is a fairly recent addition to the list of material that we find outside the cells and stuck to surfaces. Um, various different polymers as well. Um, and each of these things has a certain um, a certain role, if you like, in terms of how this is involved in forming the biofilm or forming, forming a layer of microbial colonization of a surface. So it may be involved in the construction of the actual biofilm itself. Um, it may be involved in the absorption to, a, to the actual surface. Um, it may actually be active materials in the case of the enzymes, which can act on organic material that's around the microorganisms or around the um, contaminated surface itself maybe surface active um, components. Um, in some cases, there's components which we call informative. So they're actually communicating with cells within the biofilm, um, resulting in the cells doing other activities that they would not do if those substances weren't there. Something called quorum sensing. So when you get large numbers of bacteria colonizing a surface, they tend to behave in quite a different way to when they're free in solution. And it's largely these chemicals that do that. Uh, redox active materials and various nutritive components, which will um, continue to provide nourishment for other bacteria and just continue to exacerbate the problem. Um, so the role in the biofilm, structural, um, and some are involved in ion exchange and the role of ions in terms of biofilm development is something that we're still learning a lot about. Um, certainly the calcium ions in the dairy industry um, have a major role to play in terms of the fouling of surfaces with bacteria. Um, it's, it's something that we should not underestimate. If we strip the, strip the calcium out of milk, which we can do, uh, we find that we reduce significantly the amount of biofilm that's forming in a plant. Um, degradation of polymers, um, export in, uh, from a cell, uh, sorption to materials, specificity and recognition from that inf those informative chemicals, um, a lot of genetic information there, um, released from the cells, but that's not really our biggest problem in the dairy industry. I think the main problem is the fact that DNA released from a cell is also very sticky and just contributes to the stickiness of the material that's attached to a surface. Um, so we have a lot of things going on inside the biofilm. It's a very, the main message, take home message from this is there's a lot of chemical components here and they're all um, causing us a challenge in terms of removing um, deposits from the surface. And this is uh, just a slide of how these things build up. So we start off with um, absorption to a surface, uh, normally of organic material, proteins and so on. Uh, that may come from milk that's being processed. And then we have the bacteria attaching to that surface and they just tend to grow on that surface, more organic materials added to it, more bacteria grow till we get to a point where we have a very mature uh, biofilm or deposit on the surface. Um, and from there we get release of enzymes and microorganisms into the fluid, into the milk passing by um, and contamination of our products and all sorts of problems resulting from that. Um, Biofouling doesn't just occur on stainless steel surfaces, although most of our surfaces are stainless steel. We have issues with ultrafiltration membranes, which pose a very large surface area in our plants. Um, and we have a number of organisms that we know are persistent on those surfaces. And persistent cells are something I've talked about, I think, in a previous webinar. Um, so these cells, are, you, you can regard them as persistent in two ways. Firstly, because they continue to be present on the surface of the membrane and continue to cause us problems run after run um, during the dairy season um, and contaminating products with um, enzymes and, and bacteria that we don't want. Um, and then we also have the other form of a persistent organism where even if we provide um, sanitizers or chemicals to these organisms, 
they are often not enough to kill the population completely. So there will be a level of persister cells um, that exist um, in our plants, and they're very, very difficult to get rid of. They're just they are still there despite the fact that we're adding chlorine or some other sanitizer. And this persister cell um, formation or this persister cell um, issue is something that not doesn't just affect the dairy industry; it affects every um, every sector of our lives, basically. Um, including the medical industry where we get bacteria that are persistent in the face of antibiotic therapy. Um, and these organisms persist in a, despite the dairy fluid, so it doesn't matter what type of dairy fluid you're putting through. Um, the operating temperature, there's uh, many of these bacteria survive in quite a wide temperature range. And of course the daily disinfection, which may not be um, enough to get rid of all the microorganisms, there will be persister cells left there. So if we can't kill them, what can we do with them? Well, you know, the, this is just another example of the persistent population. So when we expose um, microorganisms to chemical, we can reduce the numbers quite a bit, but there's always this persistent level that's left. And the question is, what do we do about that? Um, this is just an example of some um, work that we have done with persister cells, with Listeria monocytogenes. Um, in this case, we're exposing them to niacin, which is a preservative that's used in things like processed cheese. Um, and again, a similar, similar sort of um, issue where we're seeing um, cells persisting over many different, or in, can, sorry, we're seeing cells persisting with an increase in concentration of the chemical. Um, either sanitizer or preservative in this case. So you get that initial drop down um, and then you get persister cells continuing to exist. Um, and this is just two examples of uh, two different organisms. Um, oh, sorry, one different organism, but in this particular case, it was grown in a, a nutrient rich environment, which meant we even have more persister cells present. So in a nutrient deficient environment, uh, we tend to have a better chance of eliminating these organisms in a nutrient rich environment, such as we have in a dairy plant, um, that challenge becomes greater. Okay, and this is just another example of using increasing concentrations of antimicrobials and we can keep on increasing, but we still end up with this persistent population at the end, uh, which will eventually grow up next time we start the manufacturing plant um, on a subsequent run. Um, and we end up with high numbers of bacteria, which are going to cause us problems. <clears throat> um, this slide here is um, you know, just emphasizing the problem, I guess, that the first problem is that we don't really know when we're getting a buildup of foulant on the surface. We have no measure of this, as I mentioned earlier, and that causes us an initial problem and concern. Um, we find that um, the material will build up further and further. Um, and the only reason we can detect a problem is if we rinse the surface or take a sample of product out of the plant and we know we have high numbers of bacteria in that, in that uh, sample. So we really lack the information in terms of the extent of the problem. We don't know the chemicals that are involved in generating these phalons. Um, as I say, we can detect bacteria and so on, but that's only a part of the problem. There's an awful lot more there um, than just detecting the bacteria that are being released into the product. Um, we can try using biocides or sanitizers, but we know, as I showed you earlier, there will always be some cells left. So the biocide is not going to get rid of anything. Um, but the other thing that is um, important is that even if we do kill the cells, there's still that biomass, what I call biomass, which is, um, you know, that slide where you saw that outline of the bacteria once the bacteria had been removed. That's also called a bacterial footprint. And it's some of that biomass that's left behind after the um, bacteria have been killed. And that can provide a source of an anchor point for further bacteria and also an anchor point for further phalant in, in any system. So we can add more cleaning and sanit um, cleaning chemical and biocides to try and eliminate the problem. We never completely eliminate it. And it just goes on, goes round and round in circles. Um, and uh, this um, diagram in the middle is just an, an example of another way of looking at it. I guess this guy is trying to vacuum up a dirty spot on the floor or dirty spots on the floor. And as he's walking around, he's depositing more material on it. So it's just a never ending issue uh, that we have never really completely cleaning the surface. Um, this graph is 
telling us something about the effect of killing organisms and again emphasizing the total material left on the surface. So what we're looking at here is really bacteria and we're looking at the effect of biocide or sanitizer on those bacteria. And if you look at the bottom line on the graph, uh, we're looking at the viable bacteria, so the number of cells that are alive after the treatment with that biocide. So right through these subsequent treatments, we've got four different treatments going on here over time. Um, and that is holding the levels of bacteria to quite a low level, but it's not completely eliminating the microorganisms because of these persistent cells, as I talked about earlier. Um, in the upper lines on this graph, uh, what we're looking at is the total number of cells that are still on the surface. So in this particular example, uh, we see after biocide treatment, uh, we can see that um, the in the blue lines, uh, we're getting the total cell count um, after biocide treatment and the total cell count of the control. So we're not actually removing cells by treating with the biocide. Um, we're still ending up with cells still on that surface. A lot of them have been killed, but there's still a lot of bacteria on the surface. Um, in this particular case, the biocide we're using was hydrogen peroxide, which is a biocide we do use in the dairy industry quite extensively. Um, the organisms we we're using in this particular case was a pseudomonads, uh, which of course is an enzyme producer of a psychotroph and a concern in the warm milk part of the industry. Okay, so if we can't kill these organisms effectively um, and we're leaving a lot of material behind after our standard cleaning and sanitizing systems, what can we do? Well, the idea is to try and improve what we do in terms of removing the material from the surface. Um, and one option are these new generation enzyme cleaners um, that have been developed that tend to be better because they're targeted at the organic material on the surface. Um, so these enzymes have a number of advantages. One, they're targeted, but two, they are thermophilic enzymes. So they operate at quite a high temperature and they operate at a low pH. Why is that important? Because if we want to make enzyme treatment cost effective, we need to be able to reuse the enzyme cleaners. And in the past, this has not been possible uh, because the enzyme cleaners uh, needed to operate at a fairly neutral pH and round about mesophilic temperatures. And while they work quite effectively, they can't be stored because microorganisms will grow in that solution um, and, and cause us further problems. So, with a, an enzyme that operates under these conditions, we have the option of being able to reuse these enzymes. Um, and the other reason for looking at these enzymes is that it's an environmentally friendly approach to cleaning uh, manufacturing plants. And we're always getting hammered from uh, various different authorities for trying to improve uh, environmental awareness in the dairy industry and sustainability. And these enzymes are organic um, proteins, which cause less damage to the environment than throwing waste caustic um, out of our manufacturing plants. So yes, these um, enzymes operate at low pH, uh, but the low pH is just simply a buffer. It's not a strong acid. And so release of this into the environmental waste treatment in terms of um, the material that comes out of the plant is a lot easier than trying to deal with strong caustics and strong acids. So there's the environmental um, benefits, there's a targeted approach to cleaning, and there's also the fact that we do have the option, um, potentially, of reusing these enzymes, which makes them more cost effective than they would be otherwise. Okay, so the work that we've done on these, um, we, we were asked to, to see if we could um, show how these might work in terms of microorganisms of importance to the dairy industry. And the first thing we started to look at was pathogens. And we picked Coronabacter sarcosacchiae and Listeria monocytogenes, both of which are an issue in our industries. Um, and we um, grew these and did two trials on them, one looking at their growth on plastic plates and how we could actually use these enzymes to remove the organisms and the biomass, so and the material they produce from a surface. 
um, a plastic surface and also a stainless steel. The plastic surfaces are easy for us to use in the lab, that's why we use them. Stainless steel is less easy. So the plastic's kind of a screening tool and the stainless steel is bringing us back to reality in terms of what we're trying to do in the dairy industry. The enzymes that we were looking at um, are in the central part of this uh, slide. So alpha amylase, two different types of protease, and endogluconase, which will degrade some of that extracellular polymatrix substances, the polysaccharides that we talked about before. Um, we have the control caustic uh, treatment, and also just the control, which is, is the buffer used uh, for these actual, actual trials at pH four. Um, and um, the control also consisted of using 85 degrees for 20 minutes. And then we use two different detection systems. So the first was to detect the biomass, which was the material on the surface, um, which is the organic material, uh, which we really want to remove. So we're trying to remove the um, milk proteins, the milk soil, if you like, and also the bacterial soil in terms of polysaccharides, or those, or those bacterial footprints we saw before, remove those from the surface. And we can detect that by using a stain uh, which will give us an indication of how much biomass or biological material we're removing in total. Um, and then we also have a, a test called an impedance assay, uh, which allows us to detect the viable bacteria um, that are left on a, on a surface after treatment. But by far the most important thing from our point of view is how much of this biomass can we remove compared with a standard cleaning system like caustic. And this is an example of what we use in the laboratory. So we have two systems. The first is this plastic plate system. And you can see if the plastic plate is fouled or dirty, we can stain with uh, crystal violet stain and very easily see the um, purple color, which can be measured on a spectrophotometer. So we can actually quantify the depth of color there. Uh, which indicates how much bio, biomass we actually have left on their surface. So if we have a clean surface, we'll have you know, no visual color at all. If we have a partially dirty surface, we get some um, color left behind. And a very dirty surface, we see a lot of color. Uh, so it's a nice screening tool. At, at the disadvantage is that it is a plastic surface on the stainless steel surface. Um, but then we can actually grow um, bacteria um, in a milk solution. So in this case, we're using infant milk formula for our trials um, on stainless steel coupons. And these are stainless steel coupons in this laboratory reactor system. So it gives us a more realistic appraisal of what's happening in a dairy manufacturing system simply because we're using uh, 3162 b finished stainless steel in these holders. Um, and we've also got a, a system in here with an impeller which allows us to replicate some type of turbulence or flow um, across the surface of those, of those coupons. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you a number of graphs now, and uh, four of them to be exact, uh, which, in which there's quite a lot of information, but um, we'll take you through it slowly, and you can have a look at these later and just digest what we're, what we're trying to show here. Um, so the first thing to note is that um, we, in this particular slide, we're looking at those plastic surfaces. We're looking at biomass removal. So we're not just focusing on the microorganisms. We're focusing on all the material that's stuck on the surface. Uh, so the foulant itself. And we're looking at um, in the dark brown bars before cleaning, the situation once the plastic surface has been fouled. Uh, we're looking at exposing to the buffer. So that's the pH 4 buffer. Um, at 85 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we're looking at the enzymes that uh, we were given to trial, these thermophilic enzymes, um, the amylase, the protease, and the endogluconase. And finally, a caustic control, so 1% caustic control. Um, and these are just different strains of Cronobacter sakasaki down below. So the first thing to note is that there is some variation in terms of the efficacy of these different treatments on these different strains. Um, but by and large, the effect of the enzymes, which you see in these bars here that I'm pointing to now, is greater than the effect of the caustic cleaner in terms of removing the biomass generated by the growth of these organisms in an infant formula milk system. Um, so the first one is probably the most impressive in terms of the efficacy of the enzymes compared with 
the, the caustic cleaning. Um, and the enzyme that seems to be performing the best is this endoglucanase, which attacks the extracellular polymatrix substance that's generated by microorganisms. But of course, there's all sorts of other components in there as well um, that you saw in an earlier slide. So it really is destroying that matrix, destroying that goo or that gel um, that's generated uh, when you get a foulant of this nature on a stainless steel surface in a dairy manufacturing system. So if you look at the next strain, we can see that the endoglucanase again performs the best, similarly in this strain here, similarly in this strain here. Um, this last strain, it looks like the caustic cleaner was actually performing better, uh, but that was certainly um, not the norm in terms of what we were seeing. We were seeing that the um, that gluconase uh, seemed to perform a lot better in terms of removing the biomass than um, the caustic. And then if we look at the same organism, this time on a stainless steel surface, um, so we're getting um, um, before cleaning in the dark brown bars and then after cleaning with the different enzymes and then after cleaning with caustic. So we're seeing the same pattern. Uh, we're seeing less material left on the stainless steel surface, which we'd kind of expect because stainless steel, we use that in the industry because it's less prone to fouling than plastic surfaces. Um, and so, yeah, we're seeing the same pattern as we saw before uh, with the enzyme cleaners working uh, reasonably well, endoglucanase working the best, and the caustic cleaning not giving um, as good a clean as that um, enzyme cleaner. So the same applies to this strain, this strain, and this strain. And in this particular case, which is the strain that seemed to perform um, better under a caustic removal system, um, and in this particular environment on the stainless steel, um, there really is no difference between the caustic and the enzymes in this particular case. Okay, so moving on to another organism now, Listeria monocytogenes, and the same, um, types of treatment going on here. Um, firstly, looking at the phalant on a plastic surface, and we're seeing a, a similar pattern as we saw for Coronabacter sakasakii, uh, with the enzymes performing generally better than the caustic. In all cases, that would seem to be the trend. And then if we move to a stainless steel surface, um, very similar to what we saw earlier as well. So every every strain seems to perform well, particularly under the endoglucanase enzyme treatment. And seeing is believing. So in addition to doing the trials that my student um, did late last year, we also did some microscopy. So here we're looking at acridinone stained material which will stain the bacterial cells um, an orangey color, um, depending whether they're live or dead. And there's also a lot of other material in the background which also stains. So this is just organic material that's there, um, and there's quite a lot of matrix material present. So rather than go through each of these in turn, uh, the first one here that I've got the light on at the moment is the control. You can see there's quite a lot of viable bacteria in there. There's also a lot of material in the background, which represents the phalant. Um, on the surface. And as we go through the different treatments, we see there's varying amounts of viable cells and phalant on those surfaces. The last two are starting to look a little bit cleaner because we've got the black background there. But the one on the end, which is that endoglucanase again, uh, we see that's the cleanest of the lot. So we can see visually that that surface is a lot cleaner. Yes, there appears to be some cells still there, but it's certainly a lot cleaner than any of the other treatments um, that we've been using. And then focusing on the microbial cells themselves, the main purpose of this trial was really to look at the total biomass removal or biological material that we wanted to remove from the surface. Um, but now we're looking at the microbial cells themselves and uh, looking at Coronabacter sakasakii and Listeria monocytogenes. Uh, both of these incidentally were isolated from dairy plants, so they're dairy organisms that um, have caused problems. Um, so the numbers before treatment and the numbers after treatment. So in both cases, we're getting a, um, a situation where we have many viable cells present. But of course, these cells have been exposed to 85 degrees, low pH, so we would expect that. So it's not unexpected. Uh, they would have a good microbial kill. And what was really more important than this 
uh, was the biomass removal that we saw in the earlier slides. Okay, so what is next? Well, there's a number of things that we'd like to do. Um, we'd like to try fouling on, um, looking at fouling and microbial biofilms from other organisms. So the, going back to Sakasaki and Listeria monocytogenes were chosen um, for a couple of reasons. One, one, the company that we're working with is, ki is quite interested in pathogens and the food safety aspect really is something that everyone can relate to. But the reality of the dairy industry is that most of our concerns are not really food safety concerns because we largely have food safety under control. It's the everyday thermophilic bacteria, the psychotrophic bacteria, the spore formers that cause us an everyday headache in a manufacturing plant. So I'm very keen that we continue on this, with this work um, and look at the efficacy on those organisms um, and the biomass produced by those organisms, particularly the psychotrophic ones because they're known to produce a lot of that extra polysaccharide material uh, more so than many of the other um, organisms that we deal with. So that would be a you know a really good test for these enzymes of seeing how we can remove um, deposits that consist of psychotrophic bacteria in that type of environment. Um, the other thing that we'd like to do, most of our work you know consists of looking at individual organisms, but the reality is that um, in a lot of the surfaces that we deal with, we have more than one organism. In, in a, in a biofilm or phalan situation. So um, the DMC is a little bit tricky because you know we do have so many different processes that we go through um, that will restrict the microbial population. But we are kidding ourselves, I think, if we believe that we're largely dealing with a single organism at any one point in time. So we really need to look at the efficacy of these enzymes on a multi-species environment. So where you've got all the different organisms interacting together, essentially talking together, working together, um, contributing to the nature of the fowl that we have on the surface through the production of acids and enzymes and so on. So it, it's a whole world in itself in there and the actual nature of the fowl that's generated um, from the milk proteins or organic material coupled with the material produced by the microorganisms is likely to be at its most severe when you have a multi-species biofilm. So that's something that we are moving towards um, looking at and certainly this year. Um, we want to also look at the efficacy in different dairy environments. So rather than just using infant milk formula, which we're using for this particular trial, uh, we'd like to look at whole milk and skim milk and whey and different dairy fluids um, to get a feel for the effect of those on the phalant that we are seeing and trying to treat with these enzyme systems. So it's likely to vary quite a bit depending on the proportion of fat. Um, things like milk protein concentrates, where you have different um, iron composition is likely to influence this as well in terms of the type of phalan. So how will these enzymes operate um, in all these different systems? Um, and you know that's obviously something that we need to investigate rather than just relying on one uh, particular environment. Uh, one concern with these um, enzymes is, is there likely to be any residual enzyme that will um, result in contamination of product and therefore deterioration of product. And according to the people who have developed these enzymes, they, they don't believe this is going to be an issue, largely because our products, and this makes sense really, largely because our products are not stored at the high temperatures and low pH as necessary for these enzymes to act. So they will not act at a neutral pH. Um, and, you know, the temperatures that we store our products are not um, 85 degrees. So the possibility of residual enzyme causing problems in terms of the breakdown of proteins and so on in our products is unlikely. Uh, the other um, feeling is that the enzymes can be rinsed out of the plant pretty readily, so that's not likely to be an issue. Uh, but it's something that we want to confirm and um, make sure that this is the case. That it's not going to, there's not going to be a problem with residual enzyme um, acting on product and causing us problems in terms of functionality and sensory and so on. Um, the other concern, of course, which we all have in the industry is cost effectiveness. And in order to make these cost effective, we do need to have a recycle system. Uh, so we, we will need to explore the effectiveness of, of reusing these enzymes. And uh, but I don't have any actual costs in terms of how much it would cost to, to clean a plant. But from my background in the industry, I feel that 
these will not fly unless the cost is close to or maybe slightly above the current cost of um, cleaning manufacturing plant. Um, there is some benefits in terms of efficacy based on the work that we've done. There's certainly benefits in terms of environmental um, sustainability. Um, but really at the end of the day, it's, it's got to be something that's, that's cost effective. And if we can reuse these enzymes, then that's, um, that's likely to be um, useful for us. The other thing that I really haven't mentioned here is the effect of health and safety. Using strong caustics and so on in the industry is, we, we tend to avoid having any health and safety issues by automated systems, but there are times when people do come into contact, in close contact with the cleaning chemicals. Uh, whereas when we're using enzymes, even if it is a pH 4, which is quite acidic, the strength of that um, acid is much, much less than what we'd normally be using in the industry. So there is a health and safety benefit by using the enzymes. Um, what I've shown you today is the effect of um, different enzymes by themselves. But the reality is the most effective system is likely to be a combination of these enzymes. So if we combine the, um, the enzymes that we've shown you today, um, they will simultaneously act on different components within the foul line. So we may be able to get an even better clean uh, by combining these enzymes together. And um, this enzyme combination is probably the best way for the industry to move forward in terms of the use of enzyme cleaners. So we'd be, um, we're, we're quite keen to actually try um, different combinations of the enzymes together. Um, and of course, eventually, rather than just doing lab trials, we do need to do some pilot scale trials uh, to see how effective these are in the, in the real world. And um, yeah, get, some, get a feel for how useful they may be um, in an everyday dairy industry. Okay, so that's all I have to talk to you about today. I hope um, that you have enjoyed the presentation. And um, yeah, I do hope that um, you've, you've gained something from this and I'd be happy to answer um, any questions you may have. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Okay, folks, you can open up your chat boxes now and um, type in questions. Um, Steve, I had a couple of thoughts along mm -hmm. the way. Um, where does the company Cindabio obtain their base um, microbes to create these enzymes? They came out of hot pools in America. So, um, you know, thermal springs, a bit like we have in Rotorua in New Zealand. Um, I don't think you have any thermal activity in Australia, do you? No, a little. No, some a little. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, yeah, so from thermal hot springs, they have quite a few in the States and they've isolated the microorganisms from there that produce these enzymes. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the ultimate source of them. And are they doing any further dairy research in America or is that all being left to Steve Flint and his team? Um, that I don't know. They haven't told me about that. I think they're quite keen for other people to trial things. Um, and I don't know the details in terms of other dairy units that may have been using these. I don't think they're just targeted the dairy industry. I think they're looking at generating enzymes for application of a variety of different um, cleaning environments. So dairy is certainly one that interests them. Um, one of the issues is that the the work that we do here is not funded by them because they, they can't fund work outside the United States. So um, I would imagine they'll be getting other people in the United States to, um, to do some trials as well, uh, but they haven't divulged any information to me about that. Right, okay. Here we are. Alice has asked a question there, Steve. Have you got Yeah, questions? I see that, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You enjoyed the photos? Yes, the photos are always good. Um, cleaning is always a challenge. Yes, it is. And operators aren't the most enthusiastic, and that's understandable too. I'm very much aware of that. Um, but if they read through the information, they will think it's cool. I, yeah, I agree with you. I think, as I said, when I showed that slide, that microscopic slide um, with the stained cells, I think seeing is believing, and it's you can show all the graphs and so on you like in the world, and um, that's nice. And I guess from a scientific point of view, we kind of like those. But you know, something visual really does hit home and, and, and does um, sell the point. So, yeah, I, I think the way to sell it to the operators is that if we can generate a system that's faster, um, that'll certainly impress them. Less time spent on the cleaning operation. 
Um, and also the safety thing, I mean, can also be important to them as well. But certainly if they can get through the cleaning process faster, that would be a, definitely a selling point. Um, the next one is from Patrick. Um, how active are equipment suppliers in offering higher cost design options to plant to minimize the buildup of biofilm, um, given the need for extended production runs in the deer industry? I don't think they're very active at all. Um, that's the way I'm, I'm reading it. I mean, we still have problems today that we had many years ago. Um, one, you know, there have been some developments in terms of plant design. And I guess probably one of the best ones is a direct contact preheater, which is used in some milk powder manufacturing plants, uh, which avoids the contact of milk with surfaces during the preheating process. Uh, so the, essentially the milk is going through a steam chamber without contact with the surface or minimal contact with the surface. You know, that to me was a, a major leap forward in terms of design. Um, it's quite an old design. There's nothing that's nothing terribly new, but it's taken a while to become established, certainly in New Zealand. Um, we are seeing it in quite a few plants now. So that, you know, helps in terms of extending the operation time of plant. But um, really, it, it is a challenge. And I think that, you know, there's only so much that can be done in this area. And I think that the equipment design people um, realize this and apart from that direct contact preheater which is which to me is uh, you know real real benefit there were very few other developments in the design area that I can I can think of that are um, likely to be an advantage I mean we have to push milk through stainless steel pipe work it's you know it's got to go through it can't just be um, it, it can't we can't lack contact with surfaces and as soon as you get a contact with the surface you're getting the fouling of that surface with um, milk components and bacteria and so on. So it's it's something that's going to naturally happen wherever we have surfaces. And yes, we can minimize those surfaces, but certainly never completely eliminate them. So um, yeah, certainly a hard thing to do. I guess in the past, you know, we've seen developments in areas such as ultrafiltration, where we've moved away from the old plate and frame type ultrafilters many, many years ago to the spiral round systems, which enable a lot more shear and therefore less build up of material. You know, but even then we're still having problems with fouling and um, it's, uh, I guess the way we've tried to deal with it in recent years is by having more frequent cleans, but also having pieces of equipment that tend to foul up more than others, such as evaporators and cycling them through on a regular basis. So we have surplus equipment and we can always have one on clean while the other ones are being used. So we've managed to get around it in those sort of ways, but yeah, it's it's hard to, you know, think of a design that's going to be, um, that's going to eliminate the problems that we see in terms of fouling. I was thinking it would be really good to see a video, a time lapse of the um, of the enzymes breaking down the biomass. Yes, it? yes it would, yes, yes. I w <laughs> there was, um, just trying to think of how we could do that. I mean, we can do things down a microscope mm -hmm. um, and it may be possible to do something like that, yeah. yeah. The, um, the system that I would think of using is um, we have to use a glass surface because you can see through the glass quite easily. Um, but we have reactor systems that can foul up or produce biofilm on glass surfaces and then we can put the enzyme through and see that visually disintegrate. So it's possible to do something like that. There we mm. are. There's a job for another student. So yes. at, at the moment, Steve, you were saying you've had one master's student working on this. Yeah potentially more in the future? Well, that's why we've got some more master's students which will um, need projects at the start of probably June. Mm -hmm. So I'm targeting um, that time for um, one or two more master's students to look at some of these what next things that I put on the screen today. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, plenty of scope, I think, for them to work on, you know, looking at the combination of enzymes in particular, uh, but also looking at some of the multi-species biofilms and some of these other organisms that we haven't really looked at yet. Terrific. Well, thank you very, very much. We don't seem to have any more questions coming through. Yep. So, um, thanks, folks, for attending. Um, I am currently working on the, on the um, timetable, the schedule for semester two, 2019. So if anybody has any suggestions, please email me 
and um, I'll consider those suggestions. Steve, thank you very much for your time and effort. And You're welcome. Greatly, greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm.